that out. God will come and confirm this over and over again. What I'm saying, why am I telling you the story? I'm telling you the story that we're not going to Ford Field for a nice day with great worship. We're going to prepare the way right now. Prepare the way. The, the call doesn't start then. It's actually right now. When we begin to seek his face and call upon him, Lord, visit my children. Deliver me from my addictions. Come to Michigan and make it the state that turns it all around. Few months of National Day of Prayer before the call in May, before the call in September. Three hundred thousand gay and lesbian men and women gathered together at the mall, <coughs> had their day. By the way, we are we are believing and praying for the greatest jailbreak, the freeing power of Jesus. We are seeing divine encounters, gay, lesbian men and women. Listen, God wants to come visit them on their road to Emmaus or on their road to Damascus and lead them to a street called Straight. And I'm not joking. We held a call in San Diego in 2008. God spoke to us to raise up a prayer movement for the salvation and deliverance of gay, lesbian, men, and women. Powerful dream which we saw. Praying hands rising, massive praying hands rising over the skyline of San Francisco. Oh. So God, I want to raise up a prayer movement that contends for radical conversions. 2008, November, uh, uh, October, and right into the beginning of November, we prayed 40 days of fasting in California. Amen. And God would actually convert and save and deliver gay and lesbian men and women. A couple of years, a year or so ago, I was in California. My, my sister uh, uh, introduced me to a lady. She tells me her story. Story. She says, I was a radical lesbian activist. I spoke at their gatherings and on their stages. She said, but something happened in November 2008. I had a soul-like conversion and the love of God broke into my life so profound. Seeing America turn back to God. But in the dream, Luke 
Luke 1, 17 on a scroll and unraveled before me. He will go on before the Lord, the spirit, the power of Elijah. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the rebellious to the wisdom of the righteous. I wake up and the Lord in my heart spoke to my heart. What I'm pouring out in America is stronger than the rebellion. You see, Elijah came in the darkest hour of Israel's history. Only 7,000 out of 10 million had not bowed the knee to Baal. They were offering up their babies as sacrifices to Molech. They were state-sanctioning sexual immorality. Welcome to America. They were becoming hostile to the prophetic church. Welcome to America. But in this context, in the darkest hour, God raises up the greatest prophet. Elijah steps on the scene and does a massive revolution. You can't read Malachi 4, 5, and 6 and think it's a nice little dad playing baseball with his kids. That might be a part of it. But he is saying, when the curse is on a nation, I will send you the prophet Elijah. He will turn. It is, it is, a, it is a spirit. It is a revolution. It has his nature on it. Fire in his eyes. Fasting and prayer. No toleration of sexual immorality in his own heart. No toleration. It's that spirit of Elijah that's going to come with a burning zeal. It's zeal. See, that same, that same spirit came into the church. Jezebel in the book of Revelation. I have this against you that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who seduces my bond servants into sexual immorality. Jesus appears in that passage with his eyes a blaze of fire. He doesn't come to his church gently when they've been seduced into sexual immorality. He comes with blazing eyes of jealousy and he says, I will not tolerate any other lovers. And to those who overcome Jezebel, oh, if we could just overcome that spirit in our own little churches here, we would actually get authority. We say, I'll give you authority over the nation. You can't bind what binds you. Right. How are you going to bind Islam? There in Islam, the mall, where they were holding their prayer meetings, one of the mullahs was standing and preaching a Nazarite-like message to their young people. A radical consecration to Allah. And then he says, and don't let anybody ever tell us that we shouldn't have our women clothed. When you unclothe your women, who's more holy? <laughs> Muslims obey the scriptural mandate, have children, and multiply. And the church has one or two. I won't even go there. 